presented by Alicia Hibbert from the University of Florida.
looking for two answers correct in a row, which will result in a smaller difference between the standard and the test volume, whereas an incorrect answer would result in a greater difference between the standard and the test. On average, it took subjects about 24 trials or 48 SIPs to get to this um, endpoint at which we can calculate the just noticeable difference. So to illustrate this a bit more, I'm going to actually show you with the data points animated in here. So on the y-axis, we have the delta volume or the difference between the standard and the test volume. And on the x-axis, we have the trial number. So what you'll see as these dots animate in is that we're taking the differences and we're shrinking them down until subjects make a mistake, at which point we make the difference a little bigger and we're able to pretty quickly hone in on that just noticeable difference, which in the case of this particular subject was less than one milliliter. So we have three hypotheses that we're working on with this test data. And we first hypothesize that subjects will be able to detect smaller differences at smaller standard volumes, but need bigger differences to discriminate at larger volumes. This is supported by a law well-established in psychophysics called the Weber-Fechner law. And I'm going to just illustrate what this looks like with a visual. So on the left, on the top, you have a box of 10 dots, and in the bottom, you've got 20. The difference, the absolute difference between them is 10 dots, and it's pretty easy to discriminate that you've got a doubling here. On the other hand, on the right, you've got the same difference, it's 10 dots, but with the standard being of a higher magnitude of 110 dots, it would take a larger magnitude of change for you to easily discriminate that same 10 dot difference. So you'd probably need something like 50 dots or something. So in order to answer this question, we randomized our subjects into three standard volumes. Again, that's the first SIP of each trial, which stays the same for each subject. And we have a five milliliter standard, a 15, and a 25 milliliter standard. I'm gonna move right into the results for this hypothesis and show you on this graph the just noticeable differences for all modalities with standard error of measurement. On the y-axis, you'll see the detectable delta volume, which is the just noticeable difference in milliliters. And on the x-axis, you've got those three standards. So first, for the five milliliter group, subjects are able to discriminate a difference of about one milliliter, so they can tell five mils from six mils. At the 15 milliliter standard, subjects are able to accurately discriminate between at about 1.9 milliliters, so they need a bigger difference than at five mils. And at 25 milliliters, subjects are able to discriminate a just noticeable difference of two and a half milliliters, so instead of that one mil difference from the five mil group, you can see subjects would be able to discriminate accurately from 25 mils to 27 and a half milliliters. So with this, we suggest that our first hypothesis is supported and is in line with the weber fechner law. Moving on to the second hypothesis, we suggest that the oral cavity is going to give the most rich information for subjects to discriminate bolus volume differences. And of course, in those three standard ranges, we've got subjects making the rating, as you saw in the video, giving a thumbs up or thumbs down while the bolus is in the oral cavity. But we wanted to compare that with the information they glean from just picking up the cup, looking at it, and getting a feel in their hand. And then the additional information of after the swallow. So subjects overall had nine total conditions that could be randomized into. And our results for the second hypothesis, again, are showing you just noticeable differences by group with the detectable delta volume or just noticeable difference on the y-axis in milliliters and the three standard, the three modality rating points on the x-axis here. Subjects rating by hand could discriminate a difference of two milliliters. By mouth, it's improved accuracy to 1.7 mils. And finally, for the swallow rating, subjects were accurate at about 1.4 milliliters. So here we're suggesting that our hypothesis is partially supported, but it may be the case that the pharyngeal and esophageal stage may add increased sensitivity for discriminating volume differences. And finally, we asked a post hoc question of our data, and we wanted to see whether subjects would be more accurate in detecting volume increases than volume decreases. 
there were 1,638 total trials, and we uh, narrowed that down to 847 trials in which the deltas, or the difference between the standard and the test, was two milliliters or less. We did this to avoid a ceiling effect, and so this includes differences of two mils, one and a half, one mil, and half a milliliter. When the test volume was a decrease from the standard, subjects were about 75% accurate. And when the test volume was an increase, subjects were 80% accurate. This is only a 5% difference, but we did run a binomial test on this, and we found it statistically significant with P less than 0.05. So we are finding that bias effect or that difference. And I want to sort of explain why we think we found this. So I'm going to quickly just introduce signal detection theory, which is a matrix showing the presence or absence of the signal matched with the subject's response of yes or no, signal is present or absent, giving you correct answers of hits or correct rejections, incorrect responses of misses or false alarms. And this is just showing how that relates to our study protocol with bigger or smaller and the subject response to bigger or smaller. And the reason that subjects are getting higher accuracy in the increase category is because they're more likely to say bigger than they are to say smaller when they're not really sure in those small differences. And we think people are just more willing to accept a false alarm. That is, I'm getting ready for a bigger bolus even though it's not bigger, I'm willing to accept the risk of preparing for a larger bolus versus preparing for a smaller bolus and being wrong. So what we did is we developed and tested this protocol, and so far it seems to work out well for what we'd like to do. So coming up, we have already piloted six subjects using video fluoroscopy to compare those just noticeable differences with the kinematic response thresholds, and we've got some other steps planned as well. Some considerations for the future would be that just noticeable differences might be able to be assessed at bedside. They may vary based on properties of the bolus or the person. And with this bias effect, we may be able to manipulate bias, not necessarily sensitivity, but bias to alter a subject's response to changing bolus volumes. Thank you to Dr. Humbert and to Dr. Lotto, the Swallowing Systems Corps, and University of Florida's Rehab Science Department. Now we're at our wit's end, and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, any questions? <coughs> what about the viscosity? So we're hoping to do viscosity as well, but we're not really sure yet how to standardize the way that we change the viscosities. Um, we can definitely look at thickness, but we thought of maybe looking at something like flow rate like they do with the HITSI model to make it something that you could potentially easily do at bedside. That's good, one quick question. Great work, I love that, 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 that the effort put forward. And, um, and so the, the only question I'm putting forward is when you start your kinematic work, is that you've identified a just noticeable difference uh, that the patient can perceive, you know, cognitively perceive, mm -hmm. there's still a possibility that there's a subconscious ability that is not represented in the patient's own knowledge set. We see that in the, it's been reported in the esophagus, that there's sensitivity bol uh, below thresholding and sensory uh, 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 awareness thresholding. So there's, there's actually awareness and then there's awareness. And so I just wanted you to kind of think about that. If you know what I'm get what I'm get up to, we're getting at here. Yeah, so um, some of the work in hearing and vision suggests that people in this forced choice paradigm, we are getting at basically the perceptual limits, but yeah. that is something to consider. Yeah. Sure. So thank you.